Hello, welcome to the Social Distance Reading Series, a project of the Vermont School and the Green Mountains Review. I'm Char Denord, coming to you from Westminster West, Vermont. I'm the former Poet Laureate of Vermont from 2015 to 2019, when the wonderful poet Mary Rufel succeeded me. I'm the author of several books of poetry, most recently, in My Unknowing, which came out this year on February 25th from the University of Pittsburgh Press. Um, the University of Pittsburgh Press has also published three of my other books, Night Mowing, which came out in 2005, The Double Truth, which came out in 2011, and Interstate, which came out in 2015. In 2002, my book Sharp Golden Thorn came out from Marsh Hawk Press, and in 1990, the University of Alabama Press published my first book titled The Sleep and the Fire. I'm also the author of two books of interviews. The first book uh, of interviews came out in 2011 from Merrick Press and is titled Sad Friends, Drowned Lovers, Stapled Songs. It's a book of uh, <clears throat> that contains interviews with senior American poets, including Jack Gilbert, Maxine Cuman, Ruth Stone, Donald Hall, Galway Cannell, Robert Bly, Lucille Clifton, along with four essays uh, on James Wright, Elizabeth Bishop, Robert Lowell, and Philip Levine. My second book of interviews came out in 2018 from the University of Pittsburgh Press titled, I Would Lie to You If I Could, a uh, title that I took from James Wright's wonderful poem, To the Muse. And finally, uh, I co-edited this book with my predecessor's poet laureate, um, Sidney Lee, and it contains, this is a anthology of Vermont uh, poetry, contains over a hundred Vermont poets, including, of course, Robert Frost, beginning with Robert Frost, uh, and others, Leland Kinsey, David Budbill, Julia Alvarez, Hayden Carruth, Norman Duby, Rachel Haddis, Major Jackson, Galway Cannell, uh, Louise Gluck, uh, Grace Paley, Mary Rufel, Neil Shepard, Ruth Stone, Ellen Bryant Voigt, Robert Penn Warren, um, uh, let's see, Veranda Porch, um, Bianca Stone, Martha Zweig, Karen McAdden, Liz Powell, Dan Chasen, Jay Perini, Jody Gladding, Greg Delante, Wynn Cooper, Paige Ackerson Keeley, and 80 more. These, these are just a few that I've mentioned here, and I wish I could mention all of them. Vermont has such a rich poetic tradition, perhaps the most august tradition of, per capita of any state in the country. So this book, published by Green Mountain, Green Writers Press, I'm sorry, in Brattleboro, Vermont. I'm going to uh, read several poems from my new book, along with a few poems from my man new manuscript that I'm still working on, titled Illiterate Heart. I'm, I'm going to start with a poem titled I Wept with Joy Above the River. I wept with joy above the river. I wept with sorrow above the river. My tears were clear, both sweet and bitter. One leaf cried out to another, empty me today of all my color, fill me tomorrow with a shot of sugar. This was the still ritual for my feet, to stand on the earth that took of earth, earth with ill, and sing. I should mention this poem was inspired by the old English poem, Earth to Earth. It contains that quote from that poem, Earth, Earth with Ill. The second poem that I'd like to read is, um, a, is a letter to the president titled, Letter to the President from a Citizen, August 21st, 2019. The quoted lines in this poem are from Osip Mandelstam, the Russian poet's poem, Stalin Epigram. Mandelstam was imprisoned in Vladivostok, where he died of cold, starvation, and illness in 1938. Imprisoned by Stalin, I should say. 
Letter to the President from a Citizen, August 21st, 2019. I write to you, Mr. President, from inside the cell in which you've locked the country. It's alive in here with huddled masses. You call your enemy, you call invaders, including me. A citizen you're holding as well in your detention, center of fear and loathing of the other. Although you were different too just yesterday in the persons of your mother and father's father. I hear echoes inside these walls that are invisible, but hard with history, repeating the words of martyrs that fly like birds from the past into now. This one in particular from a hole in Vladivostok. Quote, no longer can I feel the ground beneath me. Whenever there's a snatch of talk, it turns to the Kremlin mountaineer who pokes out his finger that alone goes boom, end of quote. Do you hear a chorus of beautiful voices singing right here beneath the sky? Every tyrant resurrects the same. This uh, next poem is titled Checklist. Checklist. The bone that aches in the rain of lies. A turnip instead of cake. The fire that feeds on the breath of witnesses. Even a stone then speaks. The echo of her no in the outskirts and streets. The sword he brought instead of peace. The red coal an angel places on the tongue like a treat. The sentence of his sentence, pennies worth more than gold. Others and then some. The trees with so many tongues that says, the truth resides inside the wind and blows for those who hear it. A kiss on the cheek that doesn't turn. The nerve that takes its stand by keeping its seat. The pauper in the park who says, of these ends it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. The bell that heals itself by ringing. A smile in the hole. The eye that sees when closed. Waking, waking. The next poem I'll read is a poem as called, uh, this is, this is a villanelle, Sex Is. Sex is the nail that only drives part way, then bends the trail of snakes across the earth. Sex is the lord of void inside the clay that turns to flesh from breath in a single day. Sex is the salve we rub into the hurt, the sweet, addictive sweat that smells like hay. Sex is the knife we use in the dark to betray our love for nothing, cut out its heart. Sex is the fire that burns all day and into the night, the prayer too easy to say. Sex is the wanted God who hides in the dirt, the master spy behind the lines, the gray then bleeding sky on the eighth impossible day on which we were aroused by shame to flirt. Sex is the evening wear we wear all day, the tight reptilian suit that smells like hay. I'm going to read a few other poems from this new manuscript, Illiterate Heart, begin with this poem, The Flames. The flames ghosted my eyes in a stare that fixed on the mouth inside the fire which sang as it soared, as it roared. Everything you've ever done and are doing now will turn to smoke. It spoke in syllables that turned to ash as it burned the alder, smoke, and oak. Then me, catching the tinder inside my stare and spreading to my bones where it flared. 
So when I walked, I scorched the earth, and when I sang, the sky accompanied me on its harp. I felt my blood turn to oil as I threw more limbs onto the pile until nothing was left in the hunger of flames, save some stick still hissing at the center with an acrid smell and wisp of smoke that rose like a ghost. No, a shadow. No, grief. This next poem is titled, I Stand Beneath the Mountain with an Illiterate Heart. I stand beneath the mountain with an illiterate heart and imagine the clouds as angels singing a silent song that we can hear somehow because it's also echoing inside us where a valley I call my heart and mind is one, listens and listens but never fully understands where my eyes also hear and hear from seeing and seeing, but never fully see. The earth is crying. I stand beneath the mountain with an illiterate heart and listen to the hermit thrush I cannot see in the brush. I call back to him in my human voice that makes no sense beyond my hum. I believe in the power of a song more than words to tell the truth in a musical code that pierces the woods. I stand beneath the mountain with an illiterate heart and watch the animals and plants disappear. They're being sucked through a hole in the sky. I'm waiting to go. A year is a day. The real to real is wailing. I stand beneath the mountain with an illiterate heart that can only marvel at, at but never know creation's alphabet where to go and what to do in the face of a face that seeks to place only itself before it. A voice cries out from the mountain summit, lie down again before the lords of earth and let them creep all over you. Let just one of them speak for all the others the way they do. When I say I can't, she whispers back, you must. Just listen to the voice inside the song of every animal, plant and stone. It's the chorus called beauty. It's the list we were born to keep adding to. No one who fails to see himself in a fox or fly or drop can speak for another, although his voice may boom like thunder in a crowded hall, although he may charm a throng with empty words, although he may think the shadows are real on the wall. I stand beneath the mountain with an illiterate heart and squeak and howl in response to a toad called Golden, to a parakeet called Carolina, to a tiger called Tasmanian. Each letter of earth is so inscrutable, I know I'm living forever when I behold them. I must do what I must to save them. Today is tomorrow. This next poem is titled Medivac, I live on the medevac chopper route between Brattleboro and Hanover. This helicopter passes overhead about every other day with a victim inside. And I imagine these days, especially that victim being a uh, victim of the coronavirus. Off to the east above Monadnock, the speck of a chopper between the clouds. I watch from below like a child in my yard, knowing in the time it would take to sharpen my saw, it would turn, it would return with a victim inside. So I prayed as I waited for the thrum of its blades bending the sky to a deeper blue on its return. And when it did, I prayed again until the silence resumed across the sky that was so vast, but also, sm but also small. I could feel the hurt of the person inside. A woman I learned the following day, someone I knew still hanging on. This, uh, this next poem is a poem I wrote about a week or two ago in the midst of, uh, at the, I guess, well, right in the middle of this uh, plague that we're all experiencing. And I read a line from Der Spiegel, the German magazine. He died alone and he will be buried alone. 
And since then, I've been reading about all these tragic cases of people who were dying without being able to say goodbye to their beloved. Last goodbye in the time of Corona. The darkness arrived without your voice or touch, my love, and yet I heard your voice and felt your hand in mine. Nothing in the end, not even death, can lose my, loose my grip from yours. What can I say that echoes here and beyond? Just this. You were always so contagious, dear, my hazelnut, my vast. But unlike this germ, you infected me with a love that made me better than well, that was a gift of bliss I didn't deserve. So take these words that are not mine, but the ones you gave me in the silence of this room, and I return. You were there, I tell you. You were there when I was crossing from there to here. And you are here as well right now. No absence, yours or mine, can fill itself with itself anywhere when two have loved as we did love, if only for a time. Uh, this next poem is titled Shirt, a Parable. A soiled shirt hung wholly in my closet among my other shirts sheathed in plastic. I wore it once to a dinner with angels who were bedighted in the whitest fabric. I was a heavenly banquet. It was a heavenly banquet until I spilled some chocolate on my collar and pocket. Keep washing, I begged the darkness inside my closet, which was the only wash that washed it. But such was life in paradise where even the smallest spot branded the righteous, where just a thought turned nude to naked. So ruined then for dining again with the boring angels, I wore it everywhere as the latest fashion I manufactured by simply spilling in a line of garments I called original. And uh, I'd like to conclude uh, my reading with the title poem of my book, In My Unknowing, with this really beautiful print of a lizard, if you can see this here on the cover, by the by the artist Brian Cohen. In my unknowing, it's a epigraph. Oh, taste and see, Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see. I was driving through the fields of heaven when I realized I was still on earth because earth was all I had ever known of heaven and no other place would do for living forever. I'd grown beyond belief from seeing that everything I felt had sprung from lives I'd already lived so that I could feel the way I did, which was so much I had no idea where to begin. The crawling, the slithering, the leaping, the flying, the dying. If you had been there with me in the passenger seat and asked me about the newt or flea or pachyderm, I would have told you everything I knew which was a frightening about amount. And not only that, but just how much I love them all. Those heavenly beings, the serpent, the lion, the mosquito, the hawk, the antelope, the worm. And not only beings, but stones as well. Each particular thing so mysterious in my unknowing. I knew I was living forever. I knew the fields through which I was driving were the fields of heaven in which I was tasting and seeing, seeing and tasting. I'm going to recommend a few books in closing here that have just come out that I would love everybody to read and recommend to their friends. The first book is this wonderful posthumous book by Peter Everwine called Pulling the Invisible But Heavy Cart that uh, came out uh, last year. Peter Everwine had that magical ability to instill a silence between his words so that the, the power of the words echoed actually in those silences. Peter um, was a, a close friend. I interviewed him and um, just keep going back to his poetry uh, and finding new news each time I do. I, I love what Philip Levine wrote about his old friend on the back of this book. Peter Everwine presents us with poetry in which each moment is recorded, laid bare, 
and sanctified, which is to say the poems possess a quality one finds only in the greatest poetry. The next book I would love to uh, recommend is Spill by Bruce Smith, which came out last year and um, just contains some of the most beautiful verbal music of any poem of, of any book I've read recently. I'm just going to open to a, uh, you know, any uh, page here randomly and read the first few lines to give you an idea of that verbal music. This is from the poem Run. The world speak goes in one direction, telling its sad tale and the song before a note or two are even heard like a particle emoting from a wave pushes the sadness aside and makes an ache for something else and then the song gets enslaved to the ongoing process of master this master that so no more singing and no to your freestyle with beatbox and flexing no to your jazz flute but you heard something didn't you what was it you heard the crack of the winter kill or the car alarms Busting June's honeymoon or your name from the dream radio. Ah, just beginning. You want to keep reading every poem after just reading uh, the first few lines. And the last book I would like to um, recommend is In the Lateness of the World by Carolyn Fersche, uh, which uh, is just an astoundingly beautiful book full of uh, lyrical poetry that, that also witnesses. I don't know of another poet who is as poetic and prophetic at the same time. Powerful poet whose language we need um, today as uh, a reminder of what it means to, to really witness. And to be able to convey that in poetry is, is no small feat. I agree completely with what Margaret Atwood says here in the back of this book. Here is poetry of courage and passion, which manages to be tender and achingly sensual in what is often called political at the same time. Carolyn's first book in 17 years after the blue hour, um, The Angel of History in the Country Between Us. So thank you for, for listening. I wish you all compassion, good health, and courage, and more poetry that brings us together as this reading series is doing.